Good morning, everyone. Russ Barkley here, just escaped from prison in my prison garb. Actually, I really like these blue work shirts, but very comfortable. Uh, nonetheless, in this week's research update for the week ending the 29th of September, uh, I would like to review three of the papers with the rest of the research listed in the thumbnail sketch that goes with this video, uh, as always. Uh, these are three reviews that I thought were noteworthy, and so we're going to talk about them. The first of these reviews is published in Neuroscience and Behavioral or Biobehavioral Reviews, and it is a systematic review of the neurobiological profiles of two disorders that are known to coexist at a fairly high rate, and that is ADHD with coexisting developmental coordination disorder. Many people don't realize that up to half of ADHD children are likely to be sufficiently clumsy and uncoordinated enough to warrant a diagnosis of developmental coordination disorder, or DCD. And while longitudinal studies suggest that the gross motor difficulties with coordination do seem to decline somewhat with age and neurological maturation, of course, the fine motor coordination problems may persist somewhat longer, including in some people uh, into adulthood. So the purpose of this review was to examine whether or not there were differences in the biobehavioral, if you will, in the neurological profiles of these two disorders when they coexist together. So uh, this review uh, had uh, included 15 studies of behavioral characteristics associated with this comorbidity uh, and 10 neuroimaging studies. Uh, they had reviewed over 2,300 articles, but found only about 25 met their criteria for inclusion in the review. Uh, the review concludes, as it says here, collectively, and I quote, these studies suggest that the comorbid ADHD plus DCD presentation constitutes a more severe phenotype characterized by neurocognitive differences associated with both conditions. Despite sharing some common neural features, our findings support the separate etiology hypothesis, indicating that neural network alterations in individuals with this comorbidity represent a unique neural pattern rather than simply the sum of patterns of ADHD and DCD characteristics when they co-occur. So uh, an important study that suggests that where this comorbidity occurs, uh, it's a more severe phenotype with possibly a unique set of neural signatures than we would see in ADHD or in DCD alone. So have a look at the review if you like. As always, I give the uh, internet address, what I call the hot link, uh, underneath the articles that I review over in the thumbnail sketch for this video. Our next review is on the autonomic nervous system functioning of adults with ADHD. Uh, it is also a systematic review of the literature, and it's looking at the extent to which there is dysregulation in the autonomic nervous system associated with the disorder. Now, there are lots of studies of autonomic nervous system functioning in children and teens with ADHD, going back into the 1960s, by the way, if not earlier. Uh, I even reviewed that literature back in 1978 with my good friend James Hastings, uh, where we found a sufficient body of, of studies even then that suggested that there was some degree of autonomic nervous system dysfunction linked with child ADHD, particularly in the reactivity of the nervous system to challenge or stress. So we didn't find as much evidence for resting autonomic nervous system functioning differences being linked to ADHD, but we did find a lot more evidence on problems with reactivity of the nervous system as I said, to challenge or stress. Well, here's a review. Uh, it is a review of 15 studies. 
that involved over 840 adults with ADHD, uh, including those with ADHD and, of course, a control group. Uh, and they found that there were four studies on sympathetic tone, 13 were on sympathetic modulation during tasks, and three dealt with resting state parasympathetic modulation. Uh, another three dealt with task-related parasympathetic modulation. So perhaps more detail than you, you care to know about, but the results of the studies and of the reviewers' conclusions is that the data that they reviewed, they say, revealed impaired cardiovascular autonomic modulation in adults with ADHD, predominantly in the sympathetic rather than the parasympathetic nervous system, and particularly in response to stress exposure. Uh, all of this suggests that the findings for adults with ADHD are very similar to those in child and teen ADHD, as I said, that have been documented now for more than 50 years. So uh, again, have a look at the review. It's over in Cognitive Neuropsychology, and you can find the link to it in the thumbnail sketch. The final review I want to talk about uh, is a review on a question that I often receive from families, patients, and others interested in ADHD, and that is whether the stimulant caffeine has a significant positive benefit on managing ADHD symptoms. After all, it's a stimulant, uh, and the stimulants are useful for ADHD, so why wouldn't this stimulant be so? Uh, well, one reason is that caffeine affects a very different set of neurotransmitters, uh, primarily epinephrine, uh, rather than the uh, neurochemicals that we believe are involved in ADHD, which are dopamine and norepinephrine. So um, this particular compound, caffeine, appears to be targeting a different neurotransmitter, one that has not been implicated in ADHD. But that said, uh, let's have a look at the results of this review. By the way, it was published over in the journal Brain Sciences. Uh, and as we see here, uh, the authors were able to find seven randomized controlled trials that they included in their systematic review, uh, and that these trials involved 104 patients. They also found four studies that they were able to include in a quantitative meta-analysis. Now, their qualitative review is simply going through and reporting what the authors of the studies did or did not find. And it's a, it's a pretty mixed bag, but overall, the qualitative review did not show much of a positive benefit on ADHD symptoms. However, when they did the quantitative review where they combined these papers together and do statistical analyses on the results collapsed across these four studies that they were able to use, they found no evidence of benefit from caffeine on ADHD. So no statistically significant results there. So the authors conclude that overall, the totality of the evidence suggests that there is no significant benefit of caffeine over placebo in the treatment of children with ADHD. So uh, there you have it. Uh, it's uh, pretty consistent with other reports out there uh, and showing that this is not a good drug, so to speak, or compound to be using to manage uh, ADHD, especially in children. That said, uh, there are some reports out there that as these children grow up and get into late teens and young adult uh, stages of development, they may show a preference for consuming caffeine-containing substances. Uh, and that may be sort of a, so a form of self-medication. It's obviously not working particularly well, and we find that by the time they get into adulthood, uh, they may well have moved away from these substances. Uh, but they might be trying to self-medicate nonetheless with this readily available compound that we find in many different beverages. So, okay, well, that's our three studies for this week. I hope you found them informative. Join me next week for another research update. And again, as always, uh, if you like the material that I'm presenting here, uh, please recommend us to others and think about subscribing 
to this channel. All right, everybody, take care, be well. I'm going back out and clean up another highway in my prison gear. Take care.